Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jessica Williams, Community Partnerships Manager at Chabot Space and Science Center. And I'm excited to bring another exciting program live to your homes this evening in partnership with the SETI Institute. Tonight we have with us Dr. Simon Steele, and he will be taking us on a luxury cruise to the center of the Milky Way. Dr. Simon Steele is not only a galactic cruise director, he is also director of education and public outreach at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. He, as an astronomer, he studied distant galaxies, but spends more time these days thinking about aliens and the search for life in our own Milky Way. We will also be taking questions from the audience at the end of Dr. Steele's talk, talk, so be sure to post your questions in the chat. Dr. Steele, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Uh, welcome, good evening, everybody. Um, this is the third of our joint SETI Institute uh, Chabot uh, uh, Space and Science Center monthly talks. Um, the first one was on Mars. Um, last month, we heard from Seth Shostak on aliens. And this time, we're going to get a little bit further afield. Um, and I think it is, in the current climate, good to get out of town. And so what we are going to do today, is take a little bit of a cruise across our Milky Way. Um, this cruise was planned. I'm sure you, you paid your large sums of money to, to, to sign up and get tickets um, a, a few weeks ago. Um, and our plan was to, to go to the center of the Milky Way and, and find out what's there. By coincidence, this year's Nobel Prize for Physics was won um, by two scientists who actually discovered what was at the center of the Milky Way. And so what we're gonna do now is go and see what uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andre Gers found uh, when they did their observations of the center of the Milky Way. But, but enough of this talk, I think we should probably get a move on um, and get our flight in because we've certainly got to be back by just after eight o'clock. So without further ado, here, is our spacecraft on the launch pad and um, you know a nice uh, luxury items in all comfort plus even the seats at the back near the bathrooms uh, just going to get a little overview of where we're going today um, this is just a briefing room and i'm going to bring up what is an artist's impression of our milky way galaxy and it's it's a it's a an accurate scientific uh imagination of, of our galaxy um, based on observational data. The thing is that we can't get out galaxy to actually look back and see what it really looks like from the outside. We can barely get outside our solar system and the galaxy is very, very big. We'll talk more about exactly how big this thing is uh, at the end of our journey. Um, dimension wise, it's 100,000 light years from side to side. Uh, that means that it takes even at the speed of light 100,000 years to get from one edge of this beautiful spiral to the other. You can see there's an arrow pointing to where the sun is, although at this scale, the sun is microscopic and the planets obviously even more microscopic. And you can see we're not at the edge and we're not near the center. We're about sort of halfway-ish out. And the journey we're going to take today is going to be towards the middle. And that is a distance of 26,000 light years. Uh, so it takes, at the, even at the speed of light, it would take us 26,000 years to make this journey. And that's not even coming back. So although a lot of this talk is based on very accurate astronomy and physics, our journey time is a little bit sort of um, shortened somewhat. So uh, as you see, as we go towards the galaxy, we're going to take a little, few little detours. It's not going to be a straight shot. We're going to be passing through some of these spiral arms and then into the very center where you can see it's just this, this yellowish blur. And that is basically full of stars. There, though you can't see it, there are about 300 billion stars in this galaxy. Um, and it's laid out in this, this lovely spiral pattern. For those of you who are quite old like me, you may remember this object here. Now, this is a CD and uh, the shape of a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way is roughly a similar dimensions to the shape of the CD. It's very flat and very thin. It's about a hundred times further across than it is in thickness. Uh, and so this is really a very, very thin um, spiral 
patent. Now, thin is relatively speaking, of course, we're dealing with something that is absolutely immense. Anyway, enough of this briefing room. I think we'd better actually get a get moving. And we're going to just take a spacecraft out into orbit here. And we're just gonna uh, get into an orbit around the Earth. Here we can Do this. I'm sorry. My apologies for the, the lack of screen share there. Here we go. I'm talking away and uh, I'm just going to show up this, uh, <laughs> this beautiful spiral galaxy here that I was talking about. And we're going we're gonna to get up into orbit. There's a little CD model. And here we have a view of our galaxy, uh, of our planet Earth. I'm sorry, we haven't started sharing. It, you really, it's a good job I'm not flying, I'm just the tour director. Um, what we have here is um, the view of planet Earth. You can see we're just in low orbit around planet Earth. We can uh, look up, it's a night sky. Um, and uh, down below us is the Mediterranean and the lovely Nile Delta. So we're just looping around over Egypt. And I think we need to back away from our home world for a little while and uh, take, take a bigger view. And here's, here's our planet. Um, you can see looking out from uh, above South America towards where we're gonna head. This is, this is the Milky Way galaxy that you see can see in the night sky. If you've got a really dark sky, uh, you can see the beautiful night sky and see the, the Milky Way uh, stretching out over your head. It looks like a line, of course, because remember that we said that the galaxy is a big flat pancake, the sort of similar dimensions to a CD, and we're seeing it in cross section. We're looking through this disk. Uh, we live inside the disk of the galaxy, and that's looking towards the center at the Milky Way. You can see it's a bit of a mess. We've got different colors. We've got sort of uh, what looks like smog there, and in fact, space is not that empty. It's, it's, it's full of gas and dust. And uh, we've got to get through some of that gas and dust. There's also some strange pinkish things, and we'll come back to those. We'll visit one of those as we head into uh, the center of the galaxy itself. So let's take a journey. Um, we've got to leave the solar system first, of course. And our first stop is going to be Jupiter. We're going to fly quickly past Jupiter. Jupiter is the large gas giant quite close to us. It's only five times further away from the sun than we are. We're not gonna stay very long here. We can see one of its moons, Io, with a little volcanic plume appearing below uh, the, the lower southern um, tip, southern pole. And uh, we can see the Jupiter sort of in shade. We can see obviously that the sun is to the right and, and we're heading away from the sun now. So we're gonna keep moving away from, from Jupiter for a little while. And uh, we're gonna head on out uh, we're going to gradually pick up speed as we go. And uh, very, very quickly, um, certainly quicker than, than uh, most spacecraft can go. We've, we've reached Saturn. We've gone twice as distance now, Jupiter to Saturn. And this is a lovely view of uh, Saturn and its rings. We can see one of the moons to the lower left. Um, but we, we haven't got time to stay at Saturn. We're actually going to flip around quickly to the far side of Saturn and, and take a look back to where we have come from. Uh, here we're going to look back now from the other side of Saturn, from the side of Saturn that's furthest from the sun. And we can now look through and we see the lovely rings, the light scattering through the beautiful rings. And if you look very closely just outside, roughly at about um, 10 o'clock outside the brightest ring, uh, there's a little white speck. That's not a speck on your screen. That is the Earth. And we're heading out away from the solar system. And that's roughly uh, what the Earth looks even from Saturn. And we've barely gone about, uh, you know, an hour and a half or uh, one and a half light hours out from our uh, planet Earth. Let's go a bit further. We're going to uh, go quickly past Pluto. So please do keep an eye out the window um, as we go a little bit faster because we're going to have to build up quite a bit of speed now. Um, there's Pluto, I hope everyone caught that. Uh, and now we're gonna go move into interstellar space. Now we're looking away from the Earth 
we can't see the Earth now, it's going to be behind us. And we've suddenly entered the realm of interstellar space. Interstellar space is the distance between the stars. Uh, you can see that it's not just stars in the galaxy. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, we're heading initially out towards uh, the direction of the constellation Cygnus. Uh, there's a couple of fascinating things here in view. We can see a, a rather sort of interesting right at the center, an interesting sort of reddish uh, blob. This is called the Tulip Nebula. This is a region of glowing hot hydrogen gas. And that is uh, a star forming region. I'm having to come back to what that is in a little while. It's uh, glowing because there are very, very hot stars illuminating and, and lighting up the, the hydrogen in that cloud. We can see one very bright star to the lower right of that. That's called uh, Eta Cygni. Uh, that's something, a star that you can certainly see in the night sky. Uh, visibly. Um, we're going to take a quick tour. I don't want to spend too long on exoplanets because uh, a lot of people will be talking about exoplanets. But uh, while we're in Cygnus, I just want to take a quick look at a very nearby exoplanet. Um, and my slide stopped working. Here we go. We're back in the here we go. Let's just move away here. Uh, and we're going to have a look at this, this beautiful uh, planet here as we go past. This is a, a called Kepler-452. It was a, a, a planet discovered by the Kepler mission. Uh, you can see very close by, we've got a, a lovely bright star. This star is very, very similar to the sun. It's a, a yellow, uh, medium-sized star. And Kepler-452b, it's a significant planet, as we see here in close-up as we fly past, is possibly very similar to Earth. It's, it's, it's an Earth-like planet. It's the right distance away from its star, Kepler-452, for there to be liquid water on its surface. Now, that doesn't mean that there is liquid water on its surface. Uh, and when we say it's possibly like Earth, well, Venus is possibly like Earth as well. And that certainly hasn't got much on its surface at all. It may have things living in its clouds. Um, but until we get much, much more information, until you can actually get down onto that planet, can we actually figure out what's going on? I just wanted to stop by because Kepler-452 is a fascinating planet. And you know, it seems a shame to fly past it and, and not pop in. Uh, to visit. So let's move on quickly. Um, and we're going to go back now to this lovely view of Cygnus, um, the constellation Cygnus. And we looked at a couple of objects here. We looked at the Tulip Nebula. We looked at Eta Cygni. You can see there's a big uh, dark patch uh, in the center of the screen, um, but there seem to be less stars. And in fact, it's not less stars, it's that we have a big cloud of dust that's blocking the more distant stars. This dust, I just got to note that I've stopped screen sharing. My apologies uh, for the technical difficulties here. Um, I hope this is better and thank you to Rihanna for the commentary that's appearing on my screen. <laughs> Just let me know when things aren't working. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks good now. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so yeah, where, where were we? We were, in, we were in the constellation Cygnus. We were looking at a big dark dust clouds um, near the Tulip Nebula. Uh, this, this dust and gas uh, are the, sort of the raw material for, for newborn stars. And we'll see that happening up close very soon. There's, there's two stars very, very close together midway between the Tulip Nebula and Eta uh, Cygni. And I'd like you all, if you could, to put on your x-ray goggles. You should have all been supplied with x-ray goggles. And when you put them on, I want you to see what happens to this screen. Because at the moment, we're looking at visible light. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut out the visible light and just look at x-ray light. And x-ray light comes from things that are very, very hot and releasing lots of energy. So the same screen scene, at the night sky, you in x-ray vision, once you've got your goggles on, three, two, one, looks like that. There's nothing else, all the other stars and gas and dust disappear, and you're just left with one very, very bright thing 
right in the center. This bright thing is referred to as Cygnus X1. It's in the constellation Cygnus. It's got an X by it because it's an X-ray, gives out lots of X-rays, and one because it was the first one in Cygnus that was found giving out X-rays. Let's go and take a close look. It's actually not very safe to take a close look, but I think you know we've got a, a well-built spacecraft here. So we're gonna get a little bit closer and we'll have a look and see what this bright blob of X-rays is. And so let's, oh, that's the label, Cygnus X1. As we move in a bit closer, we can see that it's actually a big blue hot star. It's a, it's a very, very large star. It's uh, much, much larger than the sun, uh, hundreds of thousands of times brighter, much, much hotter. And blue stars themselves, because they're so hot, they give out a lot of ultraviolet light. Um, they, they give out some X-rays as well but not enough to justify what you saw through your, your X-ray goggles. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fly around this object because there's something else weird happening around the back of this blue star. So let's have a little sort of a tour around here and see what's happening. So as we move around, we see it's not just a single star, there's something dancing with it. There's a very, very strange, tiny object linked by this light bridge. And as we get closer and closer and closer until we get into the orbit around this object, which turns out to be a black hole. Cygnus X1 is not just one star, it's two stars, but one star has died. Uh, it's gone through its nuclear fuel. It's and I'm gonna play this again if I can. Here we go, because it's so beautiful. It's run out of its nuclear fuel. Uh, the center of the star has collapsed in on itself and it has so much mass that it can't even support the weight that the resistance of the atoms and the neutrons and the protons have to gravity that just basically collapses that object out of existence. And you're left with this peculiar object called a black hole. Now, a black hole doesn't have any material to it. It's, it's made up of space and time. It makes it the weirdest object out there. And this particular black hole, as we get in close, is roughly the size of a city. It's probably about 10 or 12 kilometers, uh, 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 you know, uh, 10, 8 to 10 miles across. Very, very small in space terms, but that is a... Uh, uh, a lot of mass packed into this thing the size of a city. In fact, to make this object, you've actually had to squeeze about 12 suns worth of material into that small space the size of a city to make this black hole. Now, black holes are black. You can't see them because they're, they're black and they're basically invisible. The only way you can actually detect a black hole is by the effect that it has on things around it. And as, as we saw through this animation, um, the material of its neighbor, because this is a binary star, has been drawn off of the, the star, the, the stellar companion. And because of the intense gravitational field of this black hole has been pulled into, almost like water going down a plug hole, pulled into orbit around the black hole. And as that material falls onto the black hole, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter because of the friction as it spins faster and faster. It's spinning almost at the speed of light as it gets close to the black hole and it heats up. It's not only really red hot, it's blue hot, uh, ultraviolet hot, x-ray hot and that's where the x-rays come from it comes from this hot disk surrounding the black hole and once the material as it spirals into the black hole once it crosses the boundary that's called the event horizon the point of no return and goes into the black hole then of course it stops glowing because it that material can't get out so the only way we can see black holes is through the effect that it has on anything that's close to them. And this one was detected not only from the X-rays of the gas falling in, but also as you saw, it's in this dance, this rotation with the, the other star that you can see. And by measuring how fast that star revolves or dances or orbits around its companion, you can work out how massive this black hole is, how much mass it has and how big it is. So that's a really 
cool object. And that's just a taster because, you know, black holes are a good subject here. Roger Penrose, uh, the also uh, won the Nobel Prize this year for physics, uh, was a great expert in black holes and described their properties uh, amazingly well and won um, the Nobel Prize along with the other two astronomers uh, to do with uh, black holes. So this is Cygnus X1. It's what's called a stellar mass black hole because it came from the death of a star. And it's quite small in terms of black holes. Let's, let's move on a bit. We're gonna turn around now as, as we move away from the constellation Cygnus and we're gonna cross, cross over to the constellation Sagittarius. That was a bit of a detour because the center of the Milky Way is actually in the constellation Sagittarius. And so uh, we need to get back on track here. And here we have, a, again, a beautiful view of the constellation Sagittarius and just the number of stuff gone. Not only can you see all of these stars, but you can see there's some glowing gas, some, uh, some dark dust lanes, and that's the dust in between the stars and uh, uh, in interstellar space. By, by dust, uh, we mean basically soot and sand. It's either made of, of graphite, of carbon, or it's made of silicates, the stuff that you'd find uh, on a sandy beach, although the grains are tiny, they're microscopic. But there's enough of them if you look through light years of space to block out all of this starlight. There's a lot of very bright pink blobs here, and those are fascinating. As we head into the center of the, the Milky Way, we, we're going to stop for a little bit and look at one of these blobs. Now, um, the biggest one uh, you can see uh, just slightly below center, uh, that is the Lagoon Nebula. Uh, nebula is the Greek word for cloud, and they, these objects were discovered because they weren't star-like, they were sort of blobs, and then they became known as nebulae. But we're going to look at the one just above the Lagoon Nebula. Uh, you can see, again, it's a small bit of pink, but there's also a little bit of blue um, appearing, just sneaking out of the pink bit. So if we get closer to this object, we can get a little bit better view of what's happening. So we're moving through space quite, quite rapidly now. And by the time we reach this object, we're traveling to the darkness of space at the moment. Here we go. We're getting close now. We're about 4,000 light years from home. Uh, remember, it's 26,000 light years to get to the center of the galaxy. We're 4,000 away from Earth. And here we have this beautiful, it looks like a, a flower. It's called the Trifid Nebula. Um, some people refer to it as the Trifid Nebula. Uh, trifids were, were carnivorous plants from a very famous book, uh, but that has two Fs. This is Trifid, a uh, tri meaning three, and you can see that the, the red pinkish bit is sort of broken into three portions, and through a small telescope you can see those, those three portions. This is a lot of, of, of things happening here. First of all, we have it glowing a beautiful pink, and it's glowing a beautiful pink because it's made up of hydrogen gas, and that hydrogen gas is being uh, illuminated, sort of like a giant fluorescent tube by some newborn stars right at the center. Uh, you also see these lovely dark dust lanes, and this is the remnants of all the dust and gas we were talking about that spread throughout the galaxy. Uh, um, this stuff here uh, that's crossing in front of the pink stuff is the remnants or the remnants of, of the gas and dust that, that form these newborn stars. And then you have a lovely blue halo. And the blue halo is, again, because the center of this nebula, the stars are very, very hot. They're giving out a lot of blue light, just like the, the star we saw near Cygnus X1. Um, and that blue light is coming out, and then it's being reflected off all the gas and dust that's surrounding uh, the star forming region. So, so with what's called a reflection nebula, uh, where light is bouncing off of the dust and coming towards us, we've got the pink stuff, which is the glowing gas, again, due to the hot uh, stars in the center. And we're gonna move in a little bit. And um, I'm afraid I haven't got a pointer, uh, but again, if you look at the, uh, the 
dark lanes on the pink section, you see it forms a sort of backward L. Um, and if you follow the L to going from top left to bottom right, and then make a 90 degree turn and down again, you'll see that there's a little, little sort of um, uh, pinkish dark thumb uh, at the bottom of that L. And we're gonna zoom into that. And if we get a bit closer, if we move into this star forming region, we can get a view of what's actually happening there. Let's move in very carefully. There's uh, space is empty, but you know, you have to be careful you don't run into a, a star. Here we go. Here we move into that little thumb layer and here you get a much better idea of what's happening in the Trifid Nebula. This is, as I say, a star forming region. There are thousands of stars being born here. Some of them are very, very big and bright. Some of them are not. Some of them are, are smaller reddish stars. And the dark regions, it looks like a sort of slug, a giant slug, I suppose. Um, although this slug is many light years long, which is a bit scary, good for Halloween. Uh, this is the cocoon of gas and dust that gravity has squished down. And as that gas and dust collapses in on itself, it heats up, gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And then at some point it gets hot enough for the fusion of hydrogen into helium nuclear fusion and a star is born, or in this case, a whole cluster of stars. And as they are born, they start to shine, they start to give off uh, radiation and, and winds, and they blow off this cocoon, and then they become uh, stars in empty space. And we can see that with the little antennae, um, or the right-hand antennae uh, of this slug, um, that is a little sort of pinnacle. And at the very top of that, we have a star emerging from the cocoon. The longer, thinner, uh, looks like a smoke trail coming off of the top is actually a, a jet of, of material being thrown off by one of these newborn stars. And uh, gradually where it's bluer, you can see um, scattered around little pink dots. And those are stars that uh, are starting to emerge from from this nebula itself. So we're seeing stars being born here. And what the galaxy is, what the Milky Way is, is basically a giant star factory. It is making stars all the time. It makes about five or six a year. That doesn't sound much, but if you're talking millions and billions of years, then that makes a lot of stars. And uh, over the next uh, few million years, this Trifid Nebula uh, will give birth to all of these stars and the hot, winds, the stellar winds will blow away all of this gas and dust and you'll end up with a beautiful collection of stars, a star cluster. So that's the trifid. We're going to move away from the trifid and we'll have a look at what one of these clusters looks like once they've gone through this, this uh, birth and, and shedding sort of like um, the cocoon being shed from, from the emerging butterfly. Uh, we'll get a look and see what happens once all of this gas and dust has, has been swept away. So we'll just move away from the trifid and we'll travel a little bit further and we'll travel a, another um, five or six thousand light years uh, on our journey towards the center of uh, the Milky Way. This is a star cluster, as you can tell. It's a huge star cluster of, of, of many thousands of stars, and some of these stars are actually much, much larger than our sun. A lot of them are very, very bright white stars, as they see. These look like sort of diamonds shining. Some of them are, are red, uh, you can tell from, from the patterns. The the spikes that are coming out the stars, although they look pretty, they are a, a residual of the telescope that we're using to look at the stars. Those aren't real jets coming out of the stars. That's just, uh, it looks very pretty, but uh, that's just a remnant of, of, of what we're looking at um, and the telescope that we're using. This cluster is called the Westerland One Cluster. And this is about a hundred, um, actually it's less than that, it's about three and a half, four million years old. So, so it's, it's, it's old compared to us, but, but four million years doesn't even get you back um, 
to the era of the dinosaurs. This, this is a very, very young cluster of stars. Uh, remember that the sun, our sun is 5 billion years old. And so this cluster is old enough to have shed all of its uh, stellar cocoon, like the Trifid Nebula, and now these stars are shining out. And in fact, some of the larger ones uh, have an incredibly short lifetime. And within the next million or so years, they are going to explode. Uh, they are going to uh, turn into a supernova. And the biggest ones will end up forming black holes, just like the Cygnus X1 black hole that we saw earlier. And if they are stars reasonably well isolated, then that black hole will sit there and we will not even know that it's there. It'll uh, not uh, give out visible light and um, uh, we won't know it exists. Uh, however, if some of these stars and most uh, about uh, half the stars in, in the galaxy are, are in binaries that orbit each other very closely. If one of those uh, stars that explodes is a binary system, then we will detect that black hole because of what it's going to be doing to its companion, just like uh, we saw in Cygnus X1. Um, in fact, it's thought that there are probably about a million black holes, uh, maybe more, uh, in our Milky Way, and we only have confirmation of about 20. So um, that shows that there's an awful lot of little black holes out there. So that is a Westerland one. This is a star cluster. Gradually over time, of course, our Milky Way galaxy is, is spinning. It's uh, rotating. It takes about 240 million years to make one rotation. Uh, so um, that doesn't sound very fast, but it's, it's quite a speed. And so it's made uh, many rotations since it was uh, created around 12 billion years ago. And gradually as the galaxy rotates, these clusters will start sort of fragmenting. The outer members will start through gravity being spread out and you'll end up with stars that are reasonably well isolated unless they're very, very tightly packed together. Um, and that's what happened to our sun. Uh, the sun was uh, born in a star forming region, very similar to uh, the Trifid Nebula. And when in its youth, uh, it would have been surrounded by other stars in the same cluster. But then over a period of time, over the last 5 billion years, that galaxy will have sheared away and spread out that cluster. And now the sun's siblings are spread out throughout the Milky Way galaxy. That's just a beautiful cluster. We had to stop there. Um, but. Uh, we need to move on because, of course, the, the main point of this, this journey is to actually get to the center of the galaxy. So let's, let's head on in. Um, try not to hit a star again. This is just a view at the center of the Milky Way. We're getting very, very close now. Uh, this is a, shows you just how complex and how packed the Milky Way is as we move to the center. This is a beautiful image of uh, what we see as we get towards the center. There's a nice, uh, we're, we're using uh, guidance here, GPS to actually find where the center of the Milky Way is because we really don't want to get lost. Now, it looks packed, but each one of these stars uh, that you see on this, on this uh, as you look out the window of this screen, um, are actually a reasonable distance apart. They're light years apart uh, because galaxies are mostly empty space. But if we're having this panoramic view, it looks as though everything is almost touching. It's so packed out. But in fact, uh, stars very rarely collide. They're, um, they're a large separation. Um, and if you were sitting on a planet orbiting one of these, these stars, the rest of the stars will, would seem like stars in the night sky. Uh, unless you, of course, you're in a little binary system um, uh, like Cygnus X1 was. So there's a lot of red here. Remember we said the red is glowing hydrogen gas. Uh, we do have some very strange shapes going on that are probably uh, twisted remnants of when stars have exploded, when they've gone, uh, gone supernova and created the, these, these twisted patterns of, of uh, uh, light. You can see in the sort of top left-hand corner, we have almost sort of like ripples in the gas and very, very uh, brightly illuminated, probably through exploding stars or very, very bright stars. And again, everywhere we see these dark lanes of gas and dust that are gonna be the next generation 
of stars. Well, we've got a, a bullseye. We should probably head in and uh, the, the center of the galaxy is beckoning. Uh, we're very close now. We're, we're getting to about uh, 20,000 light years away from Earth, sort of 60,000 light years uh, from the center of the galaxy. I think it's probably time to, to move in and see what's happening. Uh, let's move the, our bullseye out of the way. And here we move a little bit closer. Now here we're very, very close uh, to the center of the galaxy. Um, I'm gonna put up a little scale here so we get an idea. Um, half a light year in terms of the galaxy, remember the galaxy is, is 100,000 light years across. Um, and this is the little square here shows you how packed in the stars are uh, very, very close to the galactic center. You can see we've got stars of different colors. We've got some red ones. We've got some blue ones. Blue ones are hotter than red. Uh, but uh, and generally, the uh, blue stars are, are, are brighter than red stars because they're so hot. But these red stars that you can see in this image are very, very bright. And that's because they are red supergiants. They may be very cool, but they expand in their old age to be absolutely immense. And some of these, these reddish yellow stars you see here, uh, not just bigger than our sun, but they would fill up the orbit of the planet Jupiter. These are immense stars. We've got a similar star in our night sky, Betelgeuse, uh, which is in the constellation of Orion. And now as we get into winter times, you'll be able to look up and see the bright red star in Orion, Betelgeuse, and it's one of these super giant uh, red stars. Anyway, we've got uh, half a light year is actually still a, a large distance, um, of many, many times bigger than our solar system. But in a galactic scale, we are getting very, very close to the center. And right at the center of this square, we are looking dead into the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, this is in the constellation Sagittarius. Uh, so if you look out in the night sky and you find Sagittarius, actually the, the main stars in Sagittarius looks like a, look like a teapot. Uh, at least they do to me as I'm English and um, uh, uh, there'll be a cup of tea waiting for me at the end of this flight. So Sagittarius is the constellation. Um, inside this square, uh, something is giving out a lot of radiation, a lot of radio waves, a lot of x-rays and so on. Um, and there's, this is stuff is coming from a very, very small area and it's referred to as Sagittarius A, which is the brightest thing in the constellation Sagittarius in radio waves, giving out all these sort of uh, bright radio flashes that radio telescopes can detect. It's also the brightest in, in X-rays. Uh, and yet, if you look in the, the visible light with, with normal light that we can see with our eyes, there doesn't seem to be anything particularly uh, different about what's in the center of that square. Um, there's certainly a very bright red supergiant uh, at, in the top part of the square, but right dead center, actually, there's not much at all. In fact, it actually looks there's less in the center than there is around the outside. So I think we need to take a closer look. Let's do that and let's dive towards the center of this square. And if we do that, we get into the very heart of our Milky Way galaxy. And what we see here is just this swarm of very, very hot white stars. Now, fortunately, at the center of the galaxy, there's also a big red X, so it's easy to find if you're a tourist and wandering around. Um, no, not really, there's no X. But if you look where the X is, there's nothing else apart from the red X, which is just bizarre. So we've gone to the center of this huge galaxy um, with billions, hundreds of billions of stars right to the center, and there's nothing in the middle. That's a bit disappointing. That's like going to Paris and you think there's something interesting and you thought there was maybe an Eiffel Tower, but there's nothing. There's just a hole in the ground. So, so that's, that's a bit disappointing. And it's very difficult to tell if there's anything there unless you can hang around long enough to see what's happening. And so what we can do is we can wait a while or we can watch a movie of what happens to these stars over a period of time. Um, this is an animation back from 1992. And this is an animation 
of stars made with the Keck telescope, a giant telescope in Hawaii, a 10 meter uh, mirror. And this animation and this motion was made by Andrea Gares. And what happens when we run the film, you will see these stars move. And these stars are almost like planets. And uh, by watching how they move, you can get an idea of the gravity of what's influencing the motions of these stars. So we've got a date and time in the top left-hand corner, and I'll run this movie. So 2003 to 2006, those stars are whizzing around. And if you look at the, uh, the center one, they are, they are whizzing around nothing. Um, they are very, very big, bright stars. They are moving very, very quickly. Uh, 27,000 kilometers an hour, some of them. Some of them that's a, a fraction of the speed of light. Orbiting, just like the Earth orbits the sun. Orbiting around because of the gravity of something that is completely invisible. And the only possible thing, unless you think up very, very bizarre stuff, the only plausible explanation for stars being pulled around something that's invisible is that this is a giant black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and by how fast the stars move and how uh, their orbits are mapped out, you can tell how much mass this black hole is, just as you can tell the mass of the sun by how fast the Earth goes around the sun, or you can tell the mass of Jupiter by how fast its moons go around it. That's so all exactly the same physics. And it turns out that we have a black hole at the center of our Milky Way, roughly 4 million suns worth of mass. Let's go in and take a close look at what's happening there. And here we have, as we've zoomed right the way in, there is something bizarre at the center. Here is a supermassive black hole. Here, as we orbit the supermassive black hole from different angles, we can see, similarly to Cygnus X1, we've got some material falling into it. Um, it's this accretion disk of material. It's that disk that gets hot that will uh, allow us to see the black hole in x-rays because the disk is very hot. Now this is a flat disk and yet what's happening is if we look from above the disk it's fine but if we look from the disk from the side um, the gravity of the black hole actually warps the space enough so we're seeing the back of the black hole folded over to the front which is quite extraordinary. Now a four million solar mass black hole is huge um, and to give you an idea of scale, here is the sun to the scale. And this is the sun. Remember that you can fit a million Earths into the sun. It's an immense object, um, and it is the supermassive black hole. And that's what uh, Andre Gers and uh, Reinhard Genzel won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of this object. Huge. Black hole, there are bigger ones, but uh, we have our own at the center of our galaxy. As I said, there are about a million small stellar black holes in our galaxy, but there's only one big supermassive black hole. Obviously, um, it's a popular tourist destination and you have to be careful. Um, uh, there, here comes another uh, spacecraft who's coming to look at the black hole. And what you wanna do, of course, is not get too close because if you get too close to the black hole, you, oh, okay. Um, we're not going to get that close because once you get close enough, you cannot escape. No matter how fast you fire your rockets, you uh, will basically have to travel at faster than the speed of light to escape the gravity. And you will inexorably get pulled into the black hole and uh, will never return. Or in theory, you will never return. There are... There are uh, physical theories of wormholes where you can go in uh, to a black hole and then appear somewhere else in the universe. Maybe they paid for that, that gold star standard uh, of care on that spacecraft that we just saw. 
this is uh, the most amazing thing um, in our Milky Way galaxy, and it is dead center in our galaxy. And everything else in our galaxy orbits around this supermassive black hole. Uh, we're running out of time. We've got to get out of here. Um, fortunately, we can. We weren't too close. And uh, we're going to head back. Here's a lovely view, a last look at the center of our Milky Way. It's a chaotic structure with, with um, lots of gas and dust and remnants of stars that have exploded. Uh, but we need to head home. And so we're going to turn our ship round. Uh, we're going to break the laws of physics a little bit, sort of uh, go a bit fast. Um, might be worth, as, as we do head back now, uh, close to home. We're just going to pass uh, actually uh, the nearest exoplanet to us. This is, this is uh, the star Proxima Centauri. It's only four light years away from us, so we're very close to home now. Uh, and it has a planet orbiting around it. You can see Proxima Centauri. It's a red dwarf star. It's a, a little uh, uh, dim star. Very, very difficult to see. But just uh, between the, the, the planet and, and its star, you can see two other uh, brighter stars. That's um, Alpha Centauri. Uh, that's a binary system. And those stars are very, very similar to our sun. Uh, Proxima Centauri, let's uh, quickly uh, uh, land on the surface for a second, just have a look, because that, that's the, the view we get from the surface of Proxima Centauri B. Uh, it's lovely. It's, it's um, not a place that you'd want to move to, uh, because these little red stars, even though they're small, are particularly um, volatile. They, they do let off huge solar storms. And if you're a planet orbiting a little red star, you may think, oh, this is a safe place to be, but it's the worst place you want to be. You really want to be on a planet around a lovely yellow dwarf star like the sun or like Alpha Centauri and not Proxima Centauri. That was just a quick stop as we head back. Um, but we need to get back to home and let's have a look in the night sky. As we rise above Proxima Centauri B, uh, we get a view at this bright yellow star right in the center of our viewfinder. Um, on each side of this, this yellow star uh, and more of these nebulae, these are called the, the heart and soul nebulae. Um, and it looks as though this star is right between the heart and the soul. But in fact, what we're seeing here is, is a projection. In fact, the heart and soul nebula are another uh, 4,000 light years further behind that yellow star, because this yellow star is how the sun would look uh, from the surface of Proxima Centauri B. So that's the star we're heading back to, a lovely uh, uh, yellow dwarf star about halfway out from the center of the galaxy. And so that's where we're going to head now. and. Uh, this is a nice view as we come in. I have to show this. This is, a, this is actually the, the first um, total view of our solar system taken from Voyager 1, which has just moved. It's uh, the, the spacecraft that's traveled farthest outside of our solar system. And here, this is the portrait of our solar system as we move back in. This was taken way out um, uh, at a large distance beyond Pluto as you turn around and look back at the sun and the earth and Venus and our whole planetary family viewed from outside our solar system. And that's what we're coming back through towards home. And finally, here we get back to earth, uh, view from the moon and time to land. And as we, or just before we disembark, uh, at the end of this tour, I just wanted to say a little bit more about the galaxy because we did we did cheat a little bit in our flying time. So, how big is our galaxy? How on earth can you picture an object that is a hundred thousand light years across? And the answer is you can't because it's it's far too big. But let's do this scaling exercise to get an idea of just how far we've traveled. Um, imagine that our whole solar system all the way out to Neptune is shrunk down to the size of a quarter. And so the sun now is this um, invisible size of, of a soot of dust right at the center of the quarter. And the planets are orbiting around um, out to Neptune, the furthest uh, planet, unless you count Pluto, of course, uh, orbiting around the, the knurled edge of the quarter. So that is our entire 
universe that we know and that we've explored. All the spacecraft that we've built have only barely got out to that, the size of the quarter. And in fact, Voyager, Voyager 1, um, has traveled about one quarter diameter beyond that. So, so sort of twice that size uh, in terms of distance, uh, a quarter and a quarter across. So that's how far we've managed to travel. At this scale, our entire Milky Way galaxy that we've just explored in the last 40 minutes would be the size of North America. And as we're sort of, you know, sitting here in California, we could imagine um, that the sun will be, and the solar system will be a quarter here in San Jose. And the center of the galaxy on this scale would be all the way over in Michigan, Wisconsin. The Milky Way and galaxies are absolutely immense compared to solar systems. And that's why we had to cheat a little bit on our speeds and our journey times. But I hope everybody had an enjoyable trip. I hope everyone, uh, nobody got space sick. And uh, welcome back to Earth. And thank you very much. Wow, that was an incredible voyage, Simon, uh, Dr. Still. That was great. I, I really learned a lot um, during that and um, saw some very beautiful sights. And um, we actually have quite a few questions that came in through um, throughout your program. So we probably have a time to answer, maybe to answer a few of them. Okay. Um, so the first question is, do you think that the galaxies, the Milky Way and the Andromeda might collide one day? It's quite possible. The uh, Andromeda galaxy, well, I can't, we can't say that it's heading towards us. We're both heading towards each other. They're both large, you can imagine they're both CDs if you do this scale. And on that scale, they're about eight feet apart at the moment. Um, they're, they're so, and they're moving sort of closer and closer to each other at, at quite a high speed, a few hundred kilometers per second. Um, now, whether they're actually going to collide or whether they're actually going to be in orbit around each other uh, remains to be seen. Because on the time scales that we're talking about, uh, about 4 billion years, um, the dynamics is not that clear. Uh, a lot of people I see and say that they are on a collision course, but there might be a little bit of an orbit in, in terms of that. So it may not certainly be a head-on collision. It'll be a glancing or they may even start to orbit each other. What's very interesting, of course, if, if galaxies do collide, remember that we said that star galaxies are pretty much empty space. Uh, stars are very far apart and the stars of Andromeda and the Milky Way would simply just pass through each other. Wouldn't bother each other at all. Very rare that you'd actually get a collision between the stars. What will run into each other are all these giant gas clouds, and that will be like a thunderstorm of star formation when these clouds smash into each other, and that's going to be fireworks. Wow, that's interesting. I guess we won't be here in four million years, but that's... <laughs> What's interesting is that the Earth will be here in, in four billion years. It's, it's um, you know, it's a long time ahead, but depending on, you know, there may still be life on Earth. The, the sun will still be here. It's, it will be coming to the end of its lifetime, uh, about to turn into a red giant, but it will still, you know, capable of supporting life. And who knows, whatever creature was around in four billion years will be looking up in the night sky and it will be a spectacular sight. Maybe too spectacular. <laughs> So um, why do only some stars become black holes and what makes them special? <clears throat> That's a good question. To make a black hole, you need enough mass to overcome the resistance of, of the matter, overcome the resistance of the atoms and atomic nuclei that, that, that are, make up the star itself. And so when a small star, smallish star like the sun, dies, um, it runs out of nuclear fuel and the, the inner core of the star will then collapse in on itself. And it will collapse in itself, get very, very dense, um, but eventually the atoms will stop that collapse and will support it because it's got this sort of resistance to that gravity. So that gravity is defeated. You get a larger star and in fact what happens is that the, the gravity compresses, so it actually squeezes the atoms together and uh, makes what's called a neutron star. Uh, and there you're actually combining the electrons and the protons of atoms, squeezing them together. But that 
ball of neutrons, which is roughly the size of a city, is enough to stop the collapse. And again, gravity is, is beaten at the last minute. But you get a, a, a core of a star that's big enough, that's about three times the mass of the sun in the core, then nothing can resist that collapse. And everything at that point would just disappear effectively to nothingness. And yet what's left is the ghost of the mass and that ghost of the mass creates the black hole uh, that is just uh, space that's being warped around that, that mass. Very bizarre objects. Right. So you need a big star for it to happen, a very big star. Um, we have some more questions. So um, what is the temperature of the glowing red ga gas near the center of the galaxy and could astronauts survive there? The, the temperatures in the, the glowing gas can be very hot, can be uh, millions of degrees, but it's very tenuous, it's very thin. Um, and of course, temperature as we know it, uh, when you touch something that's hot, it's because the atoms are, are, are vibrating and they're, they're, they're moving around. And if you've got a gas that's very hot, the atoms are, are, are bouncing all over each other. Um, Although it looks as though space is packed very, very densely from our perspective, from, from the density of the air on the earth or the rock you know, beneath us, this is very, very tenuous gas. This is only a few atoms uh, in, a, in a, a space that size. Although they have a lot of energy, they're very hot and they're shooting around very fast because of that energy. There's not that many of them. And so um, the, the, the a corona of the sun is a, very similar idea where the corona, the outer region of the sun is, it is a million degrees uh, and you could walk, you, you know, you couldn't walk through it, but you know, that, that, that you could move through it and it wouldn't, wouldn't harm you that way. There are other things of course that would. So, so as far as that's concerned, the, 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 the hot gas is not what you have to worry about. There's other radiation that's going on and gravitational forces that are going on. Uh, maybe you covered this, but what is the estimated lifespan for the black hole? That's a good question. And, and um, certainly that's a question for Roger Penrose. <laughs> uh, it's thought that the giant black holes at the center of galaxies will form when the galaxies form. There seems to be a very close correlation between the size of the center of a galaxy and its black hole. You get a big bulge in the center of your galaxy and you get a big black hole. Uh, our black hole isn't that large, but it's been around so, you know, for, for 12 billion years and it's still growing because it's still uh, bringing and drawing in gas, uh, dust and stuff around it. So, so it's getting bigger. Um, at some point, there won't be any gas and dust left around it to, to, to draw in and, and therefore it will just sit there. And in theory, it could sit there forever. Um, however, there is this, uh, one of the theories of, of, of general relativity is that the black holes do evaporate. They do uh, gradually lose their mass, but this is um, such a long period of time. This is, this is thousands and millions of times the, the age of the universe to do this. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, that those things aren't going anywhere yet. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. So what kind of telescope can a novice get for a really good views of the planets? Okay. <laughs> um, certainly for the bright planet like Jupiter, you can, you can use binoculars and you can see the moons, which is really cool. When I first did that, I thought you need a big telescope to see the moons of Jupiter, but even normal binoculars that you use for bird watching, suddenly you can see the four Galilean moons and that's really cool. Um, so for the rings of Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and Venus, not a, not a too large a telescope, um, maybe one with a mirror of about six inches across, something like that. Um, for the larger or for the fainter objects that we're talking about, like the, the, the Trifid Nebula um, and more distant, um, what are called deep sky objects, it's, it's quite difficult to see uh, and get nice images of these, especially if you've got a lot of light pollution. 
um, if you live in the city. So you would need a bigger telescope or you would want to be able to stick a camera on the end of your telescope and, and take, a, take an exposure, take a long time exposure. The other option, of course, hopefully, which we can all do soon is to visit your local science center and look through their telescopes. Um, and in the back, Jessica, you have a couple of lovely uh, uh, telescope domes mm -hmm. and um, that's hopefully, you know, we can all get back to looking through the telescopes there very soon. Absolutely. We're looking forward to that yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was an incredible voyage through the Milky Way and uh, just beautiful, beautiful views along the way. Thank you for such an incredible lecture. Um, and thank you all for tuning in today. It's been such a pleasure to partner with the SETI Institute on this third um, installment of this, uh, this talk series. And we're looking forward to doing more as well in the future. Um, and thank you, Dr. Still, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, and it's going to be a really great, uh, great time doing this again. And for everyone else, if you're interested, um, every Friday evenings at Chabot, we host a variety of engaging programming that you can enjoy and participate in from home. This coming Friday, we have a program called The Sky This Month, and we actually will be going live from uh, right behind me, uh, the Rachel, it's actually over here, <laughs> the Rachel uh, Telescope Dome. Um, and we'll be looking, we won't be looking through the telescopes, but we will show you the telescope. Um, and then on Friday, I'm sorry, Saturday nights at 9 p.m., we will look through the telescopes, weather permitting, for our weekly live virtual telescope viewing with our resident astronomers. So be sure to find us on Facebook um, and tune in for that. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good night. Bye-bye.